Okay, good evening. The key things for me really are that if you have any questions or you want to reach out afterwards, um, more than happy for you to come and find me uh, on Twitter. That's the best way to get hold of me. Um, and I noticed today that I'm peril perilously close to 3,000 followers. So to try and push that vanity metric up, if everyone follows me, I should, I should reach that goal today. Um, and then, of course, the blog. So as, as Dan says, I do blog a fair amount around sort of ASP.NET topics and the recent sort of uh, interest that I've had in high performance. I've done, I think, seven or eight blog posts now. And a lot of those are going to sort of talk about the same stuff that I'm covering tonight, but in a bit more detail. So if you want sort of a bit more of a walkthrough of some of the code samples, um, that's a good place to go. And then finally, this, this link here is the link to this slide deck, the whole, the whole deck. So you don't have to take photos of everything and try and remember stuff. Um, hopefully you can just sort of listen along. And as long as you've got that link, uh, you can kind of review these slides at your, at your leisure later on. Uh, I think that's what I want to kind of talk about, given that you know who I am. So um, the reason I've done this talk and the reason I'm starting to kind of think about high performance code is that we're building more and more microservices where I work. So I work for a company called Magix, um, which is based down in Brighton, where I've sort of headed up from today. And we do software as a service products for our customers. And for the last couple of years, two and a half years, I've been working on a, an analytics platform uh, that kind of bolts on to one of our existing products so that our customers can get sort of real-time data about how their job boards are performing. And that's kind of the main product of ours is a, a digital job board system used by people like The Guardian. And obviously, we have a lot of, a lot of activity on those boards, lots of jobs being posted, lots of people viewing stuff. And so we, we're sort of collecting all of that data about you know, the types of things people are searching for, uh, the types of things recruiters are posting, so that we can bring all of this together and, and give our, our sort of users, our customers, a way to report on that data. And as we've built that out as a set of microservices, we found that's been really useful for splitting up our workloads. But we've also found that it does mean that we are starting to need more and more compute. So even though we are sort of working in containers and we're, we're building this stuff um, as efficiently as we can, we are finding that some of these services have to scale a fair amount to deal with the volumes that we're dealing with each day. Um, and one of the things I sort of was interested to see if all of the new high performance features that Microsoft are kind of showing off for ASP.NET Core and how they're making that more performant, whether I could apply those to our own code base. So I've, I've spent a bit of time over the last six months or so um, just kind of looking through some of what they've been doing and seeing where it applies. And that's kind of what this talk is about tonight, is trying to, to share with you that journey. And so with that, I think I should set expectations. I am not a Ben Adams of the world. I can't look at code and immediately see exactly what's allocating um, and immediately make that code just perfect. Um, I'm a fairly sort of, I, I can consider myself an enthusiastic amateur at high performance. So for the last six months, I've, I've kind of given it a bit of a focus. So I will do my best to cover as much as I can um, and towards the end answer any questions. There will be probably some I can't answer. I will be honest and tell you I can't answer them, and I'll probably then go off and try and find out the answer for myself. Um, and I recently did correct one of these slides because I presented this in front of Mark Gravel, who I know you've got in a couple of months' time, who came up to me afterwards and he went, there's one thing wrong with one of these slides. So I was like, okay, I'll fix that. So um, that's the sort of expectations you should have of me. In terms of my expectations of the audience tonight, some of these things that I will be talking about are sort of slightly more advanced. So there will be some expectation of of knowledge of certain features. And I will try and do my best to cover off some of those, um, but I obviously can't sort of cover everything. That doesn't mean that what I'm going to present can't be consumed by you know, everyone that's here tonight. It just means there may be some bits that you need to go off and research uh, about as well. But if you hear me say GC, I mean garbage collection, the process of reclaiming memory. Um, and there will be some other sort of terms and things uh, that I'll probably drop in as we go. So I'll try and explain those when they're, when they're most useful. So in terms of what I'm going to cover, uh, so we're going to do sort of two halves. Um, so the first half should take us up to about here. And uh, we're going to start off by talking about what is performance. And then we're going to talk about how we measure it, how we actually understand what our application is doing. And then we can start looking at how we can apply some of these new features uh, to our applications to actually improve them. And uh, the ones in bold are the ones that I'm going to spend a little bit more time on. Uh, the ones in sort of not bold are I'm going to cover, but we won't go into quite as much detail. We'll see how much time we've got at the end. Uh, to make sure we get through the JSON APIs, hopefully. Um, so let's start with aspects of performance. And for me, the three things that kind of jump out at me when I start thinking about performance uh, are these kind of headline measurements, potentially. So the first is execution time. And that's, that's how quick is my, my code. But that measurement is kind of depends on what you're actually looking to measure. You might be measuring a whole flow through your application, one sort of journey, maybe an entire request that you're handling in a web application. And you may be measuring the overall execution time of that. 
but you may also be measuring individual parts of your code base. So maybe certain methods that you're interested in understanding how those are performing. Um, and typically, the quicker that you can make your code execute, the higher your throughput will be on that application. So these two are kind of intrinsically linked. Throughput is a slightly easier metric to describe to someone in the business, perhaps, because there you're going to be talking about sort of higher level concepts. So maybe how many requests per second can your application actually handle? Um, how many messages can you process off a queue if you've got some kind of worker service? Um, that's the sort of business level measurement that you're going to need to understand. And it's an easier one to measure even in production as well to get an understanding of how your app's doing uh, in those environments. Memory allocations then tends to affect these top two, and they're all kind of tied in some way or the other. So we all know that sort of allocating objects in .NET is a pretty cheap and fast operation. Um, it's very cheap for us to say we want a new object of some type, and we get given that. And all that's really happening under the hood is that the GC and the allocator are just going to bump a pointer pretty much um, and give us, some, give us some space for that object to occupy. So it's a very cheap, very fast operation, and it's very easy just to kind of get complacent and allow us to allocate wherever we want. When we start looking at high performance, where the cost implications come in is, is the actual reclaiming of that memory. So when those objects are no longer needed and a garbage collection needs to occur to free up some memory, possibly even compact the memory, um, that is going to have some impact in your application performance because it's going to have to pause and give up CPU cycles to reclaiming the memory. And so this is something that you'll start sort of thinking about as you start thinking more about performance is where is your code allocating objects that it doesn't need to? particularly where is it allocating often, very lots of short-lived objects that maybe you can avoid, um, or where is it allocating large objects that are perhaps kicking around and um, occupying space in the large object heap. Um, so these are the sort of areas that I'm going to kind of touch on tonight, and we're going to see how we can measure and actually affect some of these. So a bit of a, I guess, elephant in the room quote to, to address first. Premature optimization is the root of all evil. How many people have heard this quote in some shape or form? Yeah, like pretty much everyone. Um, so it's kind of fair, but it's also often um, misunderstood and misrepresented, I think. And there's, there's two ways this tends to get interpreted. The first is often people hear this, forget about the word premature, and just go, optimization is bad. Um, and that's not the point where this quote's coming from, really. Uh, so optimization isn't intrinsically bad. But doing it where you don't need to is, is, is the problem. And actually, to put this quote into more context, and it's actually almost promoting, in some respects, optimizing code, is that we should forget about small inefficiencies. Say about 97% of the time, premature optimization is the root of all of all evil. Yet we should not pass up our opportunities in that critical 3%. And so this is saying there are opportunities to apply performance optimization that are totally applicable or totally relevant to what you're building today. Um, and you do want to factor this into what you're doing. So I've tried to distill this down into something a little bit less, uh, less complex and less easy to misinterpret, and just say that performance is contextual. You, you know what you're building today. You know what you're, you're looking to design. Start thinking about the performance as it relates to that particular feature or that particular microservice. Does performance matter? And the, the simple answer might be that no, it doesn't matter. It's, it's just a back-end processing service. It's doing something non-critical. You just want it to do its job, and you don't want to spend too much time uh, working on optimizing that code for no actual business gain. But there are other situations where if you're building a web application and you know that you're going to be expecting peak loads of customers coming through, if you can optimize your application, you may not have to scale it as much. And that may have impacts on how much you're spending and possibly the experience your users are having. So it's entirely contextual. Whoa, there's a back to this stage. Sorry. <laughs> uh, don't want to die sort of this early on. Um, so I then boil this down to this next statement, which is, and this one is somewhat controversial, performance should be a part of every story. And I don't mean that everyone should build in time into every story to do performance optimization, but it should be a discussion, I think, that you're having with whoever's de defining that feature. So whether it's a product manager or a business stakeholder, you should at least try and find out what performance they're expecting of you. And then you can make an informed decision about whether you need to factor in time to apply some of the techniques that we'll look at tonight. Um, so make sure you raise the questions and you sort of try and eke out from the business owners uh, what, what, what performance means to them. So say, does performance matter? And they'll probably go, oh, no, not if it costs us time. And you go, OK, fine. So if we handle one request per minute, is that OK? And they go, oh, well, it's so stupid. Um, no, we, we need to handle 100, 100 requests a second. Um, and you go, OK, so performance has some importance for what we're designing. 
So try and eke out those measurements, try and understand maybe at the level of throughput what it is people are looking to achieve. And then you can you make the decision on how much you need to optimize to achieve that goal. And that might be that you say, well, time spent optimizing the code isn't that efficient, but we can just scale this service horizontally. And that's perfectly fine to say that that's your decision. Um, but at other times you may say, well, it makes more sense that you spend a little bit of time up front and eke out all of the performance you can so that you're not having to spend money scaling. So just make sure it's considered and the team is aware of what targets you've got. And that will help later down the line when you start doing measurements to tell if you're actually achieving the business goals. The other important point that I've kind of come across on this journey so far is typically performance and readability is a bit of a trade-off. Um, and when I say readability, I also kind of mean maintainability. As you'll see in the demos that we'll get to later, as you get more performant in the code, the code usually gets harder to read and harder to reason about. Um, and that can make it much harder for people to come in and change and not break it. Um, so you do need to factor that into your decisions as well. If you're building an application that's continually going to have features added to it, it's going to continually be developed by lots of different people across lots of different teams, maybe you don't want to spend too much time making it impossible for them to understand that code because the cost there is too high. And maybe you do have to scale that in a different way or think about the performance in a different way. But if it's a one-off microservice, we're doing a lot of these now where we've got something reading from a queue, it processes or does something with the data and then sticks it in some kind of data store and maybe sends a back, off, back up to S3 or something. Um, these services are pretty much designed for that one function. Um, they're not really gonna be evolved once they're tested, working and deployed. We're hoping not to touch these very often. And so we can go, well, actually readability is not as important for our team here. We can come back and, and make this as, as performant as possible. So do be aware of that trade-off and don't just assume that performance um, is, is free. Um, it does have impacts on how you can make your, your code maintainable. Um, oh, a little sneak peek there. I uh, don't know what happened to the animation. Um, so I've kind of built up this optimization cycle, which is just a kind of um, my version of TDD, but for, for optimizing code. So the first step I always recommend you start with is to measure. Um, when you're doing performance work, you don't want to make assumptions about anything because those assumptions may be wrong. Um, and you want to know if what you're doing is actually having a positive impact. So before you do anything, um, prove that you actually have a problem that you need to solve. So measure first at the kind of application level. Uh, look at the overall kind of like profiling or tracing of the application under a typical load, if you've got an existing app that you can do this to, and understand what are the hot paths, what are the critical pieces of code involved in that application that may have an impact on its performance. Because typically there are a few strands that are going to be particularly heavy services or particularly heavy request areas that are always going to get the same kind of load. And those are the ones you probably want to focus time on. Um, if you don't have an application already, then some of this you kind of have to measure as you go. And you have to build something out and see if it's hitting the targets that you had. That's a little bit harder because you haven't really got any things to go on. But build your first version of it without spending too much time. Measure that, see if it's hitting objectives. Um, and if need be, you can continue this cycle. So once you've measured, and this might be, as I say, profiling or tracing the whole application, but it may also then be getting measurements at the, the method level, maybe benchmarking your code and finding out for particular pieces of the application, um, how, how quick is it? What, how long does it take to execute that method? And what kind of uh, allocation overhead is it producing? Once you've got those numbers, then you can look at starting to optimize some code. And this is where you want to make small iterative steps. If you change too much in one, one big sweeping go, you're not going to have an idea of if whether all of those changes you made were all positive. The net gain may be there, and you may say, oh, we've made it quicker, but well, half of your change is actually slowing down your ultimate performance. So don't change everything at once. Change something, focus on one particular piece of code, and that may even be sometimes a line of code that you're actually benchmarking and then optimizing. And once you've optimized it, then measure again and see if that made a positive impact. Uh, see if it's pushing you in the right direction. See if there's any uh, repercussions to what you've done. So you might increase the execution time or decrease the execution time, but you might push allocations up. Maybe that's worse from where you're going. Maybe time is important to you and you're not so worried about the allocations, but you need to kind of measure and, and uh, evaluate those measurements and make sure that they do make sense of what you're doing. Once you've proved or disproved the change you've made, then you can try the next step, which is to optimize the next piece of code. And then you just want to keep this cycle going for as long as makes sense for your application and the thing that you're trying to achieve. So this is where having those ideas from the stakeholders up front is useful. If you need to hit 100 requests per second for a particular part of the application and you've met that, you can move on. 
If you're not getting there, but you feel that every change you're making isn't actually making much of an impact, maybe you've optimized as much as you can, and you should still move on uh, and look at other things. So don't get stuck in this cycle and make sure you don't sort of, you know, spend all of your time trying to seek out every nanosecond, because typically that's just a fool's errand. But try and use it as a way of proving that you've achieved what the, you set out to do. If the business have given you some time to work on performance, have measurements to show that you've, you've hit those objectives or that you've taken it as far as you can and you think there's nothing more that you can do there. So there's various ways we can measure. Um, there's lots and lots of tools. I haven't listed them all out and I won't be going into these in any great detail, but a good starting point is if you're a Visual Studio user, uh, when you're debugging, you get the diagnostic tools now with the performance window and you can see things like the actual memory usage and the places where the garbage collections are occurring. Now be aware that that is in debug mode, so not optimized code and there's debugging overhead. It's not you know, benchmarking, but it's, it's a good indicator of, of how your application is performing, and it's a very cheap and quick way to start getting those numbers. Um, so that's a good starting point. If you want to do it on sort of release code, then you want to look at using profiling tools. Uh, Visual Studio has profiling that you can run against the application. There's Perfu, which is hugely complicated, hugely powerful. I really haven't got my head around it all yet. Um, and I've personally found that dot trace and dot memory from JetBrains, so if you win, win that license tonight, you're in a good place. Um, those are very good products. They make it a little easier. The UI is designed to be a bit more friendly to someone that's new to uh, working with measuring these kinds of things. And they're really good tools for getting an overall idea of you know, what's happening in your application. You typically want to do this not just on your dev machine, but actually under ideally a load test environment. Um, some of these you can even run against production. Uh, Perfu can collect against production services as long as you're a bit careful but you want to get as realistic measurements as you can about uh, what's actually happening in the application. Because again, you could make assumptions that a particular feature is really popular, but if the numbers don't bear that out, it's not worth optimizing it. And then these ones are a little bit less important, but you might find them useful, is actually uh, tools to look at the IL code. So when you compile your application in Visual Studio, say, your C Sharp, your F Sharp, your VB ends up as intermediate language code in your DLL files. Um, and you, we can inspect that and look at it. And it's not super easy to read, but you can start to pick up patterns in there. And it can be occasionally useful for finding things like where boxing may be occurring in your code. Uh, so boxing of a value type and the unboxing has a cost. So if you can identify that in the IL, that can be handy. Uh, virtual method calls, you might see that you're doing lots and lots of virtual calls, which could be slower than direct calls. Um, so these are kind of things that you might be able to glean by looking at that level. And you can sometimes tell just by looking at the number of lines of IL that are generated for a particular method how optimal it is. If it looks like it's not optimal, you might go in and try different things to see if you can get that to reduce the number of instructions. And the other important thing is not to forget about production. Um, production metrics and monitoring is more and more important as we move towards uh, kind of microservices. Before, it was a little easier to reason about what was happening in an individual sort of monolith application. But as we start to move into distributed services, um, metrics and monitoring are the real way to tell about what's going on. Um, so we use, uh, we use Datadog at our office at the moment for metrics. Um, um, monitoring, we also uh, have some instrumentation that we use. We have some logging that goes out to Elasticsearch. We have lots of points where we try and push data out, and we're doing more and more over the, on that over the next few months. Um, but these are really important because you can see how the changes you're making in your optimization cycle are actually affecting production. Because if it's not affecting production in the way you want it to, you need to go back to the drawing board. Um, and also you can look out for regressions in that case as well. Just a, you know, a new version gets pushed. If your request per second average goes down for your site, you can inspect that and understand that. Microsoft use this in a testing environment for ASP.NET Core. So they do load testing on all of the builds of ASP.NET Core. And you can go and see their Power BI dashboard um, which shows how those compare against the previous version. So Frio is their current kind of working version that they're building now. And you can see how the Frio numbers compare to 2.2. And they can see a massive, at the moment, a massive decrease in their allocation costs, massive increase in the request per second again. And they, they watch those boards and they see if things go red and indicate that they've actually regressed some of their numbers. So these are all very important for understanding how our applications are running. One of the most useful when you start then getting into code optimization is benchmark.net. Um, quite a popular library. How many people have heard of benchmark.net? Kind of a few. Okay, so hopefully after the night you'll go away and check it out because it is very useful. Um, it is a library that you can bring into your .NET projects. Uh, you typically create a console application much like you would a test um, scenario. So you create a console app, you bring in this library, and then you build benchmarks that are gonna execute 
either code directly in that benchmark or calling out to uh, your existing libraries or your existing code base. What it provides is a way to get really high precision metrics um, in a quite scientific way. Um, and this is why it's most powerful. So what it will do is for every benchmark you create, it's going to run that benchmark in its own process. It's going to make sure it does a number of warm-up phases to uh, account for things like making sure that the just-in-time compilation has got it to its optimal state and it's measuring the kind of real code as it would be in production. Um, it also does uh, checks to see what its own overhead is and it discounts those numbers from the ultimate benchmarks that it gives you. So it's quite scientific. And then it will do many tens, maybe even hundreds of thousands of iterations of the code that you're testing to give you a real statistical sort of set of data to look at. Um, and so this is much better than just using a stopwatch, which gives you an indicative number of a one-off run, but this is going to be doing it on a much more scientific level. It's quite easy to use. We'll look at as an example in a minute. Uh, there's various things called diagnosers, which allow you to get different outputs. So by default, it will measure the execution time of the code you're testing. Um, but you can also ask it to, say, give you information about the memory usage of that piece of code, so how much was allocated in executing the code. Um, and you can even get it to spit out information like the decompiled code um, and ETW events if you want to see those in some other tool like Perfu. Um, it's also quite easy to compare how your code runs on different platforms or architectures as well. So you can switch these on if you want to. And if you're building a library, this would be really useful because then you can see how your code runs on .NET Framework and .NET Core, for example. Those might not always be the same and a change in one might not improve the other. Um, so it's always worth testing it in the places it's going to be used. And this is now used really extensively by the .NET team uh, for the Core FX, Core CLR, and the ASP.NET Core repos. Um, for all of the kind of performance critical features in there, anything that they're building that might be performance critical, they put a benchmark around it. And as part of their CI CD process, those benchmarks do get run and the numbers get compared in a, they've got a custom tool that I'm trying to find out what they're using. Um, but they're comparing those numbers and, and basically seeing between each nightly build of their code base, how are those benchmarks looking? Are they still on track? Um, have they regressed any of the performance figures? Um, so you can go and get it from benchmark.net and we'll actually have a look at an example now of how you would use this in your code. So this is a really simple boiled down kind of get started example. So it's just a console application you're going to create. So we've got a, a static void main method and in here because I've installed the NuGet package for benchmark.net um, I can call benchmark runner.run and I can pass it a generic type. So the type is the type that contains the benchmarks we want to run. There are different ways that you can run benchmarks. You can have it auto detect many classes and give you options which ones you're running for a particular test. But in its simplest form, it's easier just to point it directly at a, cl a class here. So on my class, the only thing I've added to this class at this point is this memory diagnoser attribute. So this basically says at the top here, I want to also collect memory information. So how much is allocated as part of running these benchmarks? I then have some setup code. Uh, so this is code that I don't want to measure. So I'm kind of doing this outside of the benchmark um, and so keeping these as kind of static values. So I'm going to be using a name that I'm going to be passing into this name parser object. So I'm not worried about the creation of either of those. I don't want to count the allocations of those. What I want to do is see what happens when I call the parser's get last name method. Um, so that's the piece that I put into this benchmark method here. So I just create a standard method, mark it with benchmark as an attribute, and then I can run either arbitrary code here, or this could be pointing out to code that's referenced in another, another assembly somewhere and I just call the code and execute it. So in this case, I'm just calling the, the last name method and passing in the full name. And so if I run this, you need to run this in release mode. Um, it will shout at you if you don't, because you don't want to be running this against um, non-optimized code. So it will, it will ask you to run it in release mode. And then you'll get an output. And you'll get a huge spew of information as it runs. It will tell you lots of stuff about all of the iterations and which phase it's in of the warm-up process and all of that kind of information. And typically, at the end, you'll get this summary. Now, there is a lot of backing data. You'll get a whole artifacts folder that spits out as well that gives you kind of the, the, the actual data for each iteration. So you can actually do your own proper analysis on all of the iterations if you want to. Um, but the summary is useful for kind of getting an overall picture. So here we can see a, a bit of information about the machine I was running it on, the uh, version of the .NET Core framework I'm using at the moment for that test. And then I've got one row for one benchmark of data. So the first thing I have is this mean execution time. So 163 nanoseconds is how long that method took to execute. At this point, I don't really know if that's good. It sounds pretty fast, but I don't know, you know proportionally how that is. So I've, at this point, I'm really just establishing a baseline for my application. 
Um, now that unit, the nanoseconds there will change as well, so be aware of that. If, if it was a quite slow thing that we were testing and it took milliseconds or even seconds, the, the unit would reflect that. Um, it will always scale to the lowest applicable unit depending on all the benchmarks you're running in that particular run. So 163 nanoseconds. Now because I put the memory diagnoser on there, I get these additional columns about memory. And the first ones are indicative numbers about how much pressure we'd be putting on the garbage collector from the piece of code that we're benchmarking. So in this case, it's done to sort of a per thousand operations uh, measure. So for a thousand operations, how many gen zero collections might that piece of code uh, lead to? It's not an exact science because the garbage collector can't be fully reasoned about until you're actually running your application. But on, on their numbers and their heuristics, they've established that it would, it would be about 0 0.03 times that we'd actually trigger the GC. So not very often. And if I do the sort of maths, it comes out at about 26,000 times of running that, that particular method before I'd have generated enough uh, objects that would need reclaiming and might trigger a Gen Zero collection. So that would be a, the first point where our code could pause. So that measure can be useful if you're, you're sort of comparing these things to see how likely it is they are into, to introduce load. And it's also very important to sort of watch and see if these things live long enough to potentially enter Gen 1 and Gen 2 so you can start to figure out if you've got long-lasting uh, long objects that you might need to think differently about. The other number you get is the number of bytes allocated. So here we're saying it's 160 bytes. Again, this figure will, you know, the units for this may vary. And 160 bytes is, you know, the overhead of essentially of running that method. So at this point, we understand a bit more about the, the numbers for that method. And if we were to go in and start optimizing it, we could see if we're hopefully decreasing the execution time or the allocated bytes of that method, and we can start to improve our code. So the stuff that I'm sure you're all kind of keen and interested to learn about is now sort of starting to come up. So we're going to kind of start talking about some of the features now. Um, for the first half, we're going to talk a bit about some of the features, and we're going to see some sort of more basic examples. And then when we come back from the break, we'll get into some more real code as well. But the first kind of headline feature that I think Microsoft have pushed reasonably heavily is span of T. And I'm always interested. How many people have heard of span of T? Quite a lot. Pretty good. I'm going to try and estimate that as around 60-70%. Um, how many people have actually used span of T in an application? One, two, yeah. So kind of what I was expecting, kind of, kind of reasonable. Um, the reason this is the case, I think, is partly with the way that Microsoft have marketed this feature. They've made quite a lot of noise about span of T because it has been quite a breakthrough type for them in terms of allowing them to optimize their code. Uh, and the framework and make things a lot quicker. ASP.NET Core continually gets faster and faster with each release, and it's features like this that have enabled them to do that. But one of the things Microsoft have done that I think I don't totally agree with is they've kind of said, unless you're a framework author or you're maybe into sort of high performance libraries, don't worry about span of T. And I, I'm not entirely sure that that's a good message to give. There are certainly cases where you don't need to be using it. But there are, as we'll see when we look at some of these samples, it's not a particularly complex type to get get going with. And if you're doing any kind of parsing or you're trying to get different views over bits of memory, um, you can find it quite useful. And we'll see those examples in a bit. So do consider it. And hopefully after tonight, you'll, you'll feel that it's sort of easy enough to try it out. It's not too complicated. Um, so it's built into .NET Core 2.1. Um, it's not built into .NET Framework, but you can bring it in with the system.memory package. Um, and it's, it's referred to as slow span in .NET Framework. Um, you've got this slow span fast length. They're both really, really fast. Um, so don't worry about that. Uh, it's slightly slow in framework only because with .NET Core, they can make runtime and compiler and JIT changes uh, quite easily. They don't have to worry so much about the backwards compatibility story. Um, and so they're able to actually make optimizations at the JIT level that mean that span can operate a very uh, optimal way. Um, they, don't, they don't want to make those changes in framework, so they have provided an implementation that's quick but it's just not quite as quick. But I wouldn't worry about the difference. It's equally applicable in both places uh, for use. Uh, so what does span do? It provides uh, a read-write view over a contiguous region of memory, which is potentially something we want to unpack. Um, so basically, if you've got a block of memory somewhere on the system, and the typical ones you're probably used to dealing with are heap allocated types like a, an array or a string, which is just a character array underneath. These are going to occupy a contiguous region of memory in the heap. And span can give us a view over that so that we can operate on that piece of memory. Uh, it's read-write, so we can, we can actually change values in there. Now, not in the case of strings, as we'll come to, but for arrays, if you're working with them, you can actually affect the elements in those arrays with the view that you've got on it. 
But the key thing is it's a, con a consistent type that we can use across the board for dealing with other memory types as well, but we don't have to worry about what that underlying memory is. So we can work with the stack. We can also, can everyone hear me? I realize there's like excitement happening. Um, I'll talk loudly. If you can't hear me, do raise a hand or something and I'll yell into the mic. Um, so you can also address stack memory and you can also work with native or unmanaged memory as well. But you can do so using a single type in a type safe and memory safe way. And we'll sort of see a bit more about how that works in a while. You can iterate, you can index with a span, so it's very much like working with an array. Um, it is almost as fast as an array, so there's no real overhead to that. Um, and it's also a thread safe type. Um, so what this means is you can guarantee that, uh, you can guarantee that it's thread safe because of the way it's designed. So only one thread will access a particular span at a time. Um, but you can have multiple spans pointing at the same region of memory. So that's something to bear in mind when you are creating these. Um, and as I sort of hinted at, when you're working with strings, you can work with them in the same pattern as a span, but you use a read-only span. And the reason for that is strings are immutable. So if we were allowed to change the underlying data of a string, we'd be breaking all of the trust that the rest of the framework has in the immutability of those strings. So read-only span, very similar mirrored set of APIs on that type. So once we've got a span, um, oh, actually, I've got this extra slide for you. So. Um, <laughs> Uh, when you extend a talk, you start throwing extra things in that you wish you had time for at a conference. So just to kind of visualize what's going on on the span of T, this isn't like the entire type, um, but it is quite a simple um, struct type. And essentially it has a pointer, kind of special managed pointer, uh, to a starting point in some memory. So you know where your memory starts that this span is going to look over. And then the other key thing it has is a length. And it's, these are the kind of two main fields that it maintains about uh, the data you're working with. Now, if you're working with like an array or um, managed memory, then that pointer will also keep the object alive. It's not going to just disappear and be garbage collected underneath you. Um, the, the whole system and the way, way the compiler works and the type works is it ensures the reference is kept to the object as well. So the key operation with a span is to slice into it, because just having a span over something like an array doesn't really give us a huge amount until we start looking at the power of slicing. So here I've got an array called my array. It's an, an interarray of nine elements. And I, I don't know why I did nine. It should be 10. It feels like it should be 10 every time I look at this. Um, but this one has nine elements. Um, so it's a really small, simple array. And if I want to work with this as a span, the first thing I do is call as span on it. And that gives me this span event. And so now I've got a view over that same contiguous block of memory that the array was occupying. And the array still occupies this memory. We now just have a span at, that looks over it as well. So once I've got that span, um, typically what I want to do is I want to kind of get a portion of that memory. I don't want to just look at the whole thing. I want to maybe uh, parse some data and look for particular elements within it. And a cheap way to do that is by slicing. So when you do a slice, uh, you give it a starting position and optionally a length. If you don't give it a length, it will go to the end of the object or, or the existing span. So now we have span two here, which is also a span of int, um, pointing at this, this block of memory inside the array. And so we could do some additional functionality with that. We haven't created a new array. We haven't allocated an array and copied memory into it. We're just changing our viewpoint. Um, and so I refer to this, I do photography, so one of the ways I try and describe this to anyone that's used a camera is uh, you think of a, a, a wide angle lens. You're looking at a landscape, you're taking some photographs, and you've got this really nice wide angle view of it. Now, if you see an object somewhere in the middle of that that you really want to focus in on and you want to see a bit more of it, uh, one option you've got is to walk closer. So that takes time and that takes effort, um, but you can eventually get closer to that object and take your, your nice picture of it. Or if you've got a telephoto lens and you can zoom the lens, which is really quick, you just twist the lens, you now have a focal point that's been narrowed down to the object you're looking at in the middle. And that's really what slicing does. And in the same way, slicing is a constant time, constant cost operation. So regardless of how big uh, the array or the piece of memory is that you're actually looking at, um, slicing into it is constant time, constant cost. Because it's not creating new objects and copying memory, it doesn't get more complex the bigger and bigger the object is that you're looking at or the memory is that you're dealing with. Um, it's just basically saying, well, I want to start at this position and I want to go for this length. So it's a really quick, uh, cheap operation uh, that you can use time and time again regardless of what you're dealing with. And that's where the power starts to come into it, uh, particularly for parsing of things like strings. You can you get some good power from it there. So we're going to look at optimizing some code. Um, I warn everyone, this code is like intentionally quite trivial and doesn't really have any real world business purpose because I just want to get the ideas across of the optimization cycle and eventually what span of T looks like. 
Uh, we'll look at some real world code later that maybe you can actually start using. So don't you know, take this and use this in your business, or, uh, business work that you're doing. Um, the scenario for this is very complex. We have an array, or we're going to have an array, and our business person has come to us and says, I need to know from halfway in that array, I need you to give me a quarter of its overall length. I want to give, get the elements from that middle point, which is entirely trivial, entirely pointless, but we're going to use some of the, the features that we, we talked about to apply this. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to set up a benchmark because I've got a starting piece of code that we're going to measure in a moment. So this is the start of my, my benchmark class. And in here, I've got a couple of things that are new from what we talked about previously. So first, I've got this, um, this size property with this params um, attribute on it. And this allows me to set that I want to run this benchmark three times with these three different values in the size property. So my overall scenario, imagine that normally we expect this to be about 1,000 elements long, but it's not good to make assumptions. So maybe sometimes, unless it's particularly fixed at a certain length, maybe sometimes our input could be shorter, maybe it could be considerably longer than what we're used to. So try and set some additional measurements outside of what your expected range is, just so that you can see if the benchmarking you're doing and the changes you're making work in those situations. So here we're going to run this three times with those three sizes. Because I'm needing to set my array up at the start, I can create this global setup um, method that's going to run once for the, the benchmark at the start. It doesn't add to any of our allocation counts or anything like that. It's not timed. But this allows us to create the array of the appropriate size and just fill it with some dummy data. And then at the top here, I hold on to the array. And we've got this consumer type that we'll talk about in a minute. So then we've, we've given this, some, some developer in our office has been given that highly complicated business requirement and has gone away and executed it. Um, and she or he have decided to use link. Um, so we needed to start halfway into our array and then we needed to get a quarter of its length worth of items. So they've created this link method, um, which should actually return an iron numerable probably. Um, but this is the code they were given. So we want to base, baseline this as our first benchmark before we do anything else. So we can put the benchmark attribute on it, but you can also say that this is our baseline measurement. Now, one of the problems with link is it's deferred execution. It's not going to immediately actually do anything in this scenario until someone's actually consuming it. So in this case, this is what this consume extension method and this consume type do. Benchmark.net gives us these so that we can accurately benchmark uh, link type expressions by making sure something has actually evaluated the expression. So we've done this, and now we've got a benchmark we can run. And so we'll, before we do anything else, we'll get our results. And the results look like this. So for our 10 element array, 72 nanoseconds and apparently 96 bytes. 1,000, we went up to about 2,000 nanoseconds, same allocations. And then as we went up to 10,000, we went even slower. So we can see there that the execution time gets worse the, the larger the array that we're dealing with. So that's important information for us to have. And um, the allocating bytes in this case haven't actually changed. Um, it's quite low allocation because we've not really iterated and done much with that, that uh, array that we've um, that link expression, sorry, but we have at least executed it. So maybe we think we can improve on this. Maybe we think, well, maybe better than link, we'll do a, a manual array copy here. So we'll create a new array, we'll copy into it the bits we need. And that maybe this is just a theory. We haven't proven anything, so we're just going to benchmark this idea and see if it helps. And in this case, the results look like this. So we're quicker for the 10 items and 32 bytes. So at the moment, we think, great, we've, we've, we've improved our code. But the reason we put in that additional kind of sizes is to make sure that we're consistently good. And we're still good on execution time here. We're still reduced in the execution time. But now, because we're creating that whole new array that we're copying into um, directly, we've actually created an array that's um, allocation on the heap. And again, for 10,000, we're still allocating. So that's not a good option. We'll, we'll change our plan. Um, so I figured maybe I can improve on Microsoft's code. Maybe array.copy is hugely flawed, and I'll manually uh, iterate over the array and copy it myself and see if that does anything. So again, we're just testing theories at this point, and we go, great, we're better than Microsoft, so array.copy is crap. Um, and ex allocations is the same. Okay, fair enough. But then we can see as we go up to 1,000 and 10,000, we're actually now slower than array.copy. So our theory has been disproven. Allocations are about the same. And then finally, we start looking at using our new friend of span. So what we can do is we can create a span from our array, and then we just slice into it with that operation we've looked at before. So we slice in, starting from halfway in for a length, which is a quarter of its overall length. And now we have this span of int, this, this view. Now, obviously, it depends what your consumer needs to do with this. At some point, they may have to actually allocate something. But if they've got further processing they're doing on that data, 
we've given them a view over it without creating any new memory or allocating anything at this stage. Now, in this example, when I benchmark it uh, for 10 items, about a nanosecond, um, nothing allocated, which is good. 1,000, a nanosecond, nothing allocated. 10,000, a nanosecond, nothing allocated. Constant time, constant cost operation. Slicing does not get affected by the length of the underlying array or memory that we're looking at. So here we've got a very quick operation. On my machine, it's a nanosecond. It might be faster or slower in your systems. Um, and critically, we haven't allocated anything at this point. We've now got a view that we can hand to someone that's the piece of memory they're interested in that they can potentially do further processing on. Again, they may continue to use span and slices to do that work. And as I say, this is quite a trivial example, but just to get an idea for that cycle that you might go through to prove or disprove the changes that you might be making in your code. So we can also work with strings, um, and you can use a string literal or a reference to a string, and you can just call as span on it, just as we've done before. Uh, this time you'll get that read-only span of characters because that's the underlying data type of the string and read-only because we can't change it. But once we've got that read-only span, we can do the same kind of operations to view different portions of it. So we can parse that string and we can parse it with no allocations and no cost. So we could do a slicer example starting at position eight and I can get my surname. So if I've found the index of the last space and I need to know the portion that represents my name, I can slice in for the appropriate position. I've not allocated or copied anything but I now have a view over that data and I could then do some further work. Obviously on something this short, it probably isn't really giving us much gain, but if you were parsing a large text file, as we'll look at later, these things start to add up and become much more relevant. And then I also want to just touch on the fact that we can work on the stack. So I sort of mentioned this earlier on, uh, and it's not something we're typically familiar with in most of our sort of lives. We're not often working on the stack, but it is possible. So this example comes from the Microsoft documentation. And the example that they've got here is they want to create an array that holds the first 20 items of the Fibonacci sequence. Um, and they want to do this with no allocations. So what they're going to do is they're going to use stack alloc here to create a working space for, this, for these uh, values for the Fibonacci sequence on the actual stack directly. So there's no heap allocation here. And if you were to do this traditionally, you would have to have unsafe code and you'd get a pointer back. Um, and then you would you typically have you know, more and more unsafe code as you start to work with that. But in this example, because we're saying we explicitly want this as a span event, the compiler knows that it can do this in a type of memory safe way, and it can hand us this span view over that stack allocated memory. Now, something important about stack allocation is to be careful. Um, there is a limited capacity on the stack. We can't just throw huge objects at it. So always bounds check the things. You're if you're taking input and you're creating a portion on the stack appropriate to hold the length of the, the input, make sure that's not above a certain length. Um, you know, typically a few thousands, a couple of thousand might be okay, but you just want to be a bit careful about what you're, you're storing there. In this case, 20 elements is fine. And then the rest of the operations look like working with a traditional array, except we're now working with this span event, and we're now con configuring the different elements with the appropriate value. So what you might be tempted to do, though, if you've got this method, is you say, well, great, I've got the sequence. Someone needs to use the sequence. So you might go, OK, well, I'll just return, I'll return this span of int, right? The compiler will get upset with you here, and it will give you an error. And it'll say you cannot use a local fib in this context because it may expose reference variables outside of their declaration scope. What this is telling you in a slightly verbose way is you've allocated something on the stack. That stack frame goes away when this method returns. So we can't have something that's referencing that memory after the life of this particular method ends, because that memory is no longer valid to point to. And this is where span and the compiler allow us to be memory safe about using these things. It knows intrinsically that this is stack allocated memory, and that it won't let it outside of the safety bounds of where it's relevant. Um, so that's quite useful. So if you did need to deal with this scenario, what you would need to do is create your stack allocated memory at the top level caller, whoever's kind of ultimately needs to work with this thing, and pass in your span of int into this method and then fill it. Um, and then obviously, the, the stack frame above can still be alive and that memory is still relevant. So there are a few limitations to span. Um, so if the first is that it's a stack only type. So it's a value type and we, we've, you know, again, we're going to assume that everyone's kind of reasonably familiar with value types, reference types and those kind of behaviors. The difference about this value type is that they protect it from ever ending up on the heap. And the reason for that behavior is, again, the fact it might be referencing stack memory or memory that's not necessarily in the same lifetime as the heap. So we don't want the span that's pointing to some memory to outlive the memory that it's pointing at. So it can't ever end up on the heap. Um, and traditionally, value types, they're going to try and be created on the stack or maybe in the CPU registers. But they may end up on the heap through various ways. 
um, some of the ways we're going to talk about in a moment. But the, the way they protect this is they've introduced this new keyword, refstruct, uh, in C Sharp 7.2. And this, this is a feature that basically says this is a value type that I want you to ensure through compiler and uh, sort of internal runtime code will never end up on the heap. So because of that, you're limited in scenarios where it may end up being boxed. It won't allow you to put it into those scenarios. Um, it can't be filled in a class because that class lives on the heap and therefore the memory does. Um, it can't be in a standard struct because that struct might be boxed. But you can have it inside a field of another ref struct because that is also protected by this same mechanism. Um, you can't use it as an argument as a local variable, argument or local variable, sorry, inside async methods. That becomes quite a limitation that we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the reason for that is that ends up being compiled into a class and a state machine, so we're breaking the rule above. Capturing it into Lambda expressions is a similar limitation, and it can't be used as a generic type argument at the moment. Uh, they are, there is a sort of feature request in and an issue that's discussing whether that can be made possible. So when I list these out, it starts to feel like this is a hugely limiting feature, and how are we going to deal with it? So there is this kind of related sister type called memory of T, and it it looks and feels a lot like span. It's just slightly less optimized. But because it can live on the heap when it needs to, it can, um, it can end up working in those situations like being in async methods, for example. So it's, it's a struct still. It's a read-only struct. But it, it can end up being boxed if necessary. So it's not a ref struct. Um, if you're working with memory directly and you're slicing it, it's slightly slower in terms of operation time than working with a span. So typically, you'll want to work with span wherever you can. And it's quite easy to get a span. You just call the span property on the memory. And in an appropriate place, you can then start working with a span again. And we'll see an example of that that I hope makes it a bit more concrete as to how you can combine this. So I've got this async method here. And what I'd really like to do is take in a span of bytes and data that I want to do something with. Um, but the compiler's up unhappy again. Um, and so I get this error that says, you know, parameters or locals of type span of byte can't be declared in async methods, breaking that rule that we've already touched on. So that, that limits what we can do. But we can, we can make a memory of bytes um, and allow that to be passed in. And then we can start working with the data still in a very similar way. So we could slice it. Um, and then we get a new memory of byte representing that slice. But as I say, that's a slower operation. So if we are looking for full optimized code here, what we might want to do is create a new method that isn't async that we can call out to from the async method. And at that point, that can accept a span and start working with a span. So to do that, you might then be tempted to go, OK, well, I'll create a local that represents my span, and then I can pass it in. The compiler gets unhappy in two places. We made it really upset here, and it actually underlines two things with the same warning, effectively, because we are still now breaking the rule of creating a local representation of a span, um, and it won't allow that. So the way around this is to do something like this, where you just call the, the method, kind of chaining the, the slice in this case together, and that's fine. It will work out what to do there quite happily and pass in the span of the appropriate shape there. So that's typically how you kind of work around that async one. And that's the most likely thing you're going to run into with span is you're, you're going to find yourself in async world very quickly. And you're going to have to potentially work around it. Most of you are still here, at least. It looks like pretty much all the chairs that were previously occupied are, which is always a good sign. Um, so we are going to kind of step things up and um, look at some more real world code. We're going to continue looking as well at some of the other features that you might want to start using in, in the things that you're building as well, if you're looking at high performance in particular. Um, so I want to go straight into kind of putting this into a bit of practice. So a um, few comments as well have come up sort of during the break. You know, the early example was quite trivial, and it didn't really have, you know, the measurements weren't totally fair in the sense that no one was actually consuming the data and doing much with it. So it wasn't very representative as a, as a thing to benchmark. This example, hopefully, is a kind of a bit more um, representative. And so one of the scenarios we've got at uh, work is that we, we want to get um, messages off a queue and then store them into S3, which is AWS's kind of blob store, basically. So we want to we want to get this queue message, take basically a copy of the body of the message, and just archive it away. Um, so we read the message off the queue. Uh, we need then to deserialize the message to actually inspect the values, because what we're going to do is we're going to build up a key, which is essentially like a file name or you know sort of pathing structure into where we're storing this in S3. We want to create a key that is derived from some of the properties on that data. So. This is going to look at some of the ways we might choose to begin optimizing it. And I keep looking at it and thinking there's probably other ways with the new JSON APIs I could make it even better. But the key one on this one will be just sort of focusing on uh, kind of the span slice scenario. So I'm going to dive out to code. And hopefully I've got that there. So can everyone read that? Is it OK at the back? <laughs> 
Yep, everyone's good. Cool. So this is kind of like the before scenario. So I've, I've sort of simp oversimplified slightly some of the exact code. I couldn't show the actual product code, so I kind of created this, this prototype. And this was sort of, a, I guess, a couple of lunchtimes work of recreating the problem. I did benchmark this, I promise. I'll show you the benchmarks after as kind of more exciting reveal. Um, but this is kind of very, very close to what the original code was doing. So the key thing in this method is we have this event context. So this is the deserialized object. So I'm not doing any performance work around JSON or anything in this for now. In our actual example, it's a class, and it's, it's got something like 100 properties that we may deserialize into. For, for simplicity's sake, I've kind of kept this small. Um, and so what we're going to do is derive the key from some of the values on there. So the first thing we do is we're going to use an array of strings to hold the various parts that we're eventually going to kind of concatenate together. Um, now, depending on whether or not there's a date, we always expect there to be a date in there, but just in case there isn't, we kind of work out whether we're going to include date parts in there as well, and we, we create an array of the appropriate length. And then the main piece of this is that we're going to pass in the string values from that event context into this get part method, which is down here. And it's relatively simple. We check if it's null or empty, we're going to return an unknown part, which is just this uh, static string at the top. And um, once we've established that, we're going to remove the spaces. So we're going to just do a kind of a string replace here, kind of classic code you might see, uh, to replace spaces with underscores. We then do a check uh, to make sure it's a valid part. So we have a regex expression that contains the characters that are allowed in an S3 object key. So we're going to check if it's a valid part. And if not, we're just going to return an invalid part string. And so all of these get created for all of the, the product, the site key, and the event name. We then do some basic string formatting on the, the date pieces that we're then going to build, also build up into the elements that we're going to then join. And then we're going to eventually join these pieces together with, in this case, just the slash character, uh, and to make a kind of parved naming key here. Um, and then we need it in lower, so if someone's called two lower on here, um, and we've got the lowered string. So this is kind of a close representation of the real world code. And I kind of looked at this and thought, well, this, there's, there's some stuff here where we're, we're kind of working with strings. So maybe, maybe we can optimize this. Uh, so this is our benchmark tip. We'll see that in a minute. Um, but then I went ahead and actually um, created a kind of revised version. So the first revised version looks like this. So there's some wackiness going on at the top. There is an optimization that's not very obvious that the comp compiler can do. If you create a property of a, a, a span or read-only span and pre-construct it in this quite horrible way, um, it can get slightly more optimal if you then need to work with that data. It doesn't have to do so many memory copies um, to actually kind of set this stuff up. So it's a slight perf improvement. The, the first thing I'm doing then is I'm going to calculate the event length, sorry, the event, the event context length. So this is what that key is going to end up being. And I need to pre-calculate this because I'm, I'm going to use stack alloc here. And so I want to make sure that I'm not going to allocate thousands and thousands of characters. So we, we first sort of just do a rough calculation based on the parts. Um, it's not too important, but there's a sort of method that works out. Well, if, it's un if it is unknown, it's going to be this length, et cetera. Um, the key part of this is where we're going to, then once we've stack allocated, hopefully, uh, the, the backup case is that we will end up with a heap allocation with a character array. But ideally, we have a stack allocated array. So nothing on the heap at this point. Um, and then what we're going to do is we're going to use this build part method, and we're going to pass that, that span in, that span of characters, and then we're going to be able to work with it. And we also need to track our current position because we're going to slice into that span to the appropriate point to, to start put building up our data. So inside the build part method, um, we have, uh, so I'll do a basic check to find out if it's empty, um, and if so, we can, we can use the unknown part, um, that horrible read-only span of above. Um, I do this kind of character is letter or digit check because actually that works fine for our needs. Um, and we so also allow spaces in here, so we just check the characters are all kind of valid. And eventually we should end up here where we can use this memory extensions to lower invariant to basically copy the value of this input string into our slice of that character span that we created on the stack um, at the appropriate position. And it will lower it at the same time as doing the copy for us. So we, and we also increment the position. So we keep track of where we are in that stack allocated span of characters. And we're just kind of building up the string manually here. So you can look at this code. The links are in the end slides to the GitHub if you want to have a look at it. But you can see there is more code here than what we had before. It's a little less readable. And that kind of goes into that trade-off of readability um, versus performance. Um, and ultimately, what we end up doing, once we've built up our, our span, I'm eventually, I do need a string at some point. S3, the library requires me to give it a string annoyingly. So this is the point of pain that you'll have. As you go high performance, 
you'll end up finding a point where you are forced to allocate by the libraries you're using, and you'll go, da. Um, but so I need a string. I mean, if the library let me pass in bytes or characters, I might be able to do something a little less allocated. But this is reasonable. And so let's dive. Oh, actually, I've got a v2 of this. So I'm going to show you the v2, which was sudden realization that there was one other gain that I could make. So this is almost identical to what I showed before, except I'm not pre-stack allocating anything to store the data. I'm using this new method on string here called string.create, which is a kind of slightly wacky, complicated method. What this lets us do is create a string in a way that we are allowed to mutate its contents for a very brief period of time, essentially, um, which is at creation, so before anyone's been given the reference back to it. So we're just allowed to mess around with the character array that is the underlying data for that string um, during its creation process. So it needs to know a length because it's going to pre-allocate on the heap the appropriate portion mem of memory to contain the characters that you, you need. You can then pass it in some data, basically state. Um, so in this case, I've got four things I want to pass in, so I can combine them into this new value tuple type, um, which takes all of those elements and passes it in. Um, and then I have a span action, which I've defined below. And this span action, it's a bit like a regular action, except because uh, we don't allow span to be a generic type at the moment, it can't be a regular action defined with a span as, as one of the parameters. So it's kind of reverse round, and you kind of, it knows the type is a character, uh, that we're going to have inside this span, and it pre-constructs a span for us when it gets run. A um, little complicated to explain. I have got a blog post on this that hopefully makes it a little clearer what it's doing. Um, but basically, in here, the code is almost identical to what we had before, and it's building up the parts. But now we're building them up directly into that character array on the heap that is the final string's memory. So the thing we've avoided is the, the stack allocation and then the copy of those bytes or those characters out of the stack into the final heap memory on when we call toString. So as I say, I did benchmark these, and, and these are the results that I got to. So my, my initial benchmarking, um, looking at the execution time, the original method was taking about 1,000 nanoseconds to run. On the span-based approach to so the first iteration where we used the stack allocated span, um, 449 nanoseconds. String.create was just quicker. I mean, I'm not really going to cry over 6.1 nanoseconds and call that a massive victory. Um, but it is slightly quicker. And String.create is interesting. It is more optimal, but it's probably going to be more optimal on bigger and bigger strings because there is a little bit of overhead of running that span action and having to kind of uh, cache that the first time. So when you're doing a small amount of work, it might end up being cheaper just to stack allocate and work in the stack. So this is where benchmarking and comparing these things is really important. Don't just assume because String.create sounds more efficient, that it always works out that way. Um, but it is marginally. I, in fact, some benchmarks I ran, it did slight, show slightly slower. So um, it's, you know, it's very on the borderline. The interesting thing is then on the allocation. So the original code was allocating uh, 1144 bytes. Um, the new code in both versions is six times less. It's 192 bytes. And that is the, the, the string. I, I can't reduce that anymore because that is the size of that string for the length that we're creating. So I've basically got down to no additional overhead. I've got the output that I want with no allocations above it. And so this code is, from that point of view, about as optimal as I can get it in terms of allocations. And it is a bit quicker. So this feels quite good. Now, the actual service that I'm planning to potentially put this into does, uh, it processes data uh, 18 million times a day. We've got 18 million-ish messages coming through this system that we need to store. So these numbers are quite small and insignificant on a one-on-one -on -one basis, but if you start to kind of calculate them up, that's 17 gig of allocations I've avoided a day just from, from that tweak. Um, so obviously that memory is going to be reclaimed very quickly. We can see everything's in Gen 0, so it's not long-living memory that's going to be hanging around and meaning that we've got a high memory footprint, but it is memory traffic. It's allocations and uh, garbage collections that have to occur. And then the numbers on the garbage collections, 2,700 garbage collections a day saved from this type of change. So this needs more testing, it needs more proving, and I know there's more I can do with the JSON stuff. Um, but this, this small change at the scale that we're dealing with can have reasonably significant impacts, and that's one portion of, of what that service may be doing. So the next thing I want to kind of touch on is this thing called array pool. Um, rather surprisingly, it's a pool of arrays. Um, it's arrays that we're going to reuse um, and avoid the allocation cost of creating lots and lots of arrays. So you use this in situations where you do have to create an array or some kind of buffer of, of bytes or characters very, very often in your code in some kind of tight loop. You're not necessarily going to get much advantage out of using array pool for one-off arrays here and there. 
Um, but in situations where you're doing it like per request or you know, per message that you're processing, having uh, the pool is going to give you a bit of a gain because instead of creep allocating new arrays every time, it's going to store those and then let you reuse them. So you avoid the allocation costs and you avoid the garbage collection costs. Um, and essentially, it's zero alloc. You, you have to allocate the, the arrays for the pool in the first place as they're needed. But after a certain time of use in your application, this is going to stabilize to where it's essentially zero allocations for you. Um, this is found in the system buffers namespace. Um, it's fairly easy to use. It's a generic type, so you have an array pool of whatever. Um, and you can call this shared instance on, on that type, uh, which gives you a shared pool. And typically, you'll use the shared pool because it's set up for optimal general scenarios. Um, and if you're working with types like int or things that the framework might be using arrays of as well, you'll be able to have the advantage that you're also sharing the pool with them. So if they've already allocated a ton and returned them to the pool, you're just gonna grab their ones and use them. Uh, when you want to get an array, you rent from it, um, and you need to give it a length. You say, I want an array that's this big. And you will get an array, but it might be bigger than that size. It will guarantee you've got an array bigger than what you've asked for, but not exactly, because for it to be efficient, it has different sizes of arrays, different buckets. So it starts at around 16 elements, then 32 and 64 and so on, up to about a million elements. And so you'll get one from a bucket that's at least big enough for what you need. Um, so this is important. You do have to actually track your position in that array typically, because if you want to iterate over it later, you don't want to iterate the entire array. If you've only needed 1,000 elements out of an array you've been given that might be, say, 4,000, um, it's not efficient to do that. So you kind of need to track what you're using it for, and it does get a bit more complex there. Um, when you're done with it, you return it. You must return it, because otherwise you're not getting any benefit. It will be garbage collected if you don't return it, but then you're really just having a slower way of getting an array. So don't do that. Make sure you return it, um, and you just pass the reference back, and it will then hang on to it until the next person needs one. Safety meshes. Uh, these are not cleared when they're returned. By default, the data remains in the array. Um, so this is an efficiency thing. It doesn't want to clear it and cost you time. But it does mean that when you rent array, it might have some data in it. Uh, so again, tracking your position and don't just assume that all the values are your own. Um, and if you're concerned about that, you can ask it to clear it on return. But it's just a slight performance hit because it has to zero everything out. Um, so that's the default behavior of it. Adam Signet's got a nice blog post on this that I recommend reading where he kind of covers a bit more about how and why it can be used. We will see it uh, in use later on in a roundabout way because it's used by one of the other features we'll touch on. Um, sort of how it works, it's quite simple. So here we've got a method that's going to get called really often for some, some piece of work. And internally, it needs to create a buffer of bytes and pass it on to things that it's calling. So at this point, it's allocating this array. And so this is a short-lived array um, that keeps getting created, keeps getting um, sort of released, um, and garbage collection at some point will reclaim that memory. We can change that to using the array pool. So we just ask for the shared array pool of bytes. We rent from it uh, a buffer of a 1,000, and then we do something with it. Now, I'm not worrying about position and length in this example, but that's where I say you would need to track, once you're sort of into this do something with buffer, how much you're actually putting into there, what you're actually populating it with. Because you might have a 2,000 element uh, or 2,000 byte array that you're given here. Um, so it's quite easy to switch your code over to using this. Um, and again, benchmark this, make sure you're measuring it and putting it under real load and see if it gives you performance gains. But in certainly high, uh, high loop sy systems, this will be useful. One other important thing, remember to return stuff to it. So a good pattern is try finally here to make sure that whatever goes wrong up there, uh, we do return it eventually when we're done with it um, and, and put that back into the pool so someone else can start using the buffer as soon as we're done with it. Some rough benchmarks, um, just to kind of give you an idea of how this performs, because at 20 elements, rent and return is slower than allocation, and that's to be expected. Allocation is quick. Um, rent, rent and return has to look through the buckets from the sort of next size up from what you're asking for until it finds an array that's free and in the appropriate bucket, and then it has to send it over to you, and there's some overhead there. So it's taking about 30, 30 nanoseconds in my benchmark. But it counts as zero allocations because benchmark.net can see that this sort of amortizes to zero allocations overall in a, in a realistic high performance system. Um, at about 1,000 bytes, or actually quite well before it, you can see that then allocation ends up being a little slower because the larger and larger the array, the longer it time it takes to zero out that memory and give it to us. And so at this point, rent and return actually looks quite a good proposition. Um, and again, we're getting the allocation gains there. So 
Do always benchmark with a ray pool because it doesn't always behave the way you think it will in your scenarios. Uh, so it is quite contextual and I recommend making sure your measurements prove that it's worthwhile change. Um, so the reason I said that this is going to come up later is that Pipelines uses this array pool. Pipelines is another feature that's kind of come out in the last um, sort of point one of 2.1, I think, of .NET Core. Um, it's pretty much the baby of David Fowler, who's a genius. Um, and he kind of knocked this up over a weekend, I think, and then sort of proposed it. Um, it was first implemented by the ASP.NET team for Kestrel, and it was kind of it kept internal types for ASP.NET. Um, but there was value in them actually releasing this and making this a public API in .NET Core. So it's now in included in .NET Core as well, and you can use it. Um, and its main goal in Kestrel was improving the throughput of Kestrel, um, and particularly around I.O. It's basically a nicer way of working with uh, data that you're getting from a from an external source versus streams. Streams are kind of okay, but there's often a lot of copying that goes on. You manage the buffers of all the different streams and you copy, copy data between them. So that copying has overhead and has costs. You can write performant code with streams, but even David Fowler has said it's very hard to do without making an error. Um, Pipelines kind of does all of that boilerplate for you and wraps it up into this, this IO system that we can use. One of the other key features is it uses the array pool for how it um, manages the memory. So it's going to, by default, have no allocation overhead cost for the, for the buffers internally that it's using to manage uh, the data that you're passing through the pipe. There's two sides. You have a pipe, reader, a pipe writer and a pipe reader. Um, um, and we'll see how this looks in a short sample in a moment. The other interesting thing, and it's, I won't go into too much detail, but there's this newer thing called iValue task source that was introduced. So the ASP.NET team have done a lot of work to try and make task and async code a slightly more performant. And there's a cost allocating tasks, which we have to do whenever we await. Um, so one of the things they introduced a while back was value task, which is a way of kind of having either a task or the actual data itself if it's returned synchronously. And iValue task source takes this all a step further and allows you to define a type which you can reuse uh, where you're going to have multiple awaits on an object. So in this scenario, the reader is going to await multiple times, quite probably, as it reads through the pipe. But it's going to do that in sequence, and it's only going to be one thing reading from it. So the same task can be reused each time, and it avoids unnecessary task allocations. This is all internal. You don't have to worry about any of that for using it. But it's interesting to know that these optimizations kind of continue to flow through the system. I've stolen this sample from David Fowler's. Uh, he's done a video. The link's there. I recommend watching it. He kind of talks through this demo in, in more detail than I will. Um, he's also written a quite extensive blog post comparing how you would work traditionally with I.O. on streams and then how you end up with this kind of code with, with pipes. So basically, we're going to create a pipe. And then we're going to start off two tasks. We're going to have a task that's filling that pipe with bytes from a socket. And we're going to have a task that's reading from the pipe. And these can be kicked off concurrently. So we kick off both tasks, and then we await them both to finish. In the fill end of this, the main pieces of this that are interesting are we're going to call get memory. So remember, the, the pipe is going to manage that, uh, the buffers for us, and it's going to use the array pool, and it's going to return us a memory of byte. Memory of byte because we're in an async method. So at that point, we've got some, some memory we can write into. And in this case, they're just going to use that to pass it onto the socket receive async method, so the socket can start pumping bytes in off the wire. If we read no bytes, we finish reading from the socket, so it breaks out of the loop, and we end up completing the reader, uh, the writer. Sorry. Otherwise, it tells the writer how much it's advanced by. So how many bytes has the socket actually given us on this, on this iteration? Uh, because it may have used all of the memory. It might have used some of the memory. And we, it needs to know where it is in that, that, that particular piece of memory at a given time. Uh, we also then flush it. At this point, we're flushing it, and that basically means that the, the writer has finished writing it in, and the reading end can start consuming that data. So we can have these things kind of reading and writing uh, in parallel. Um, if, if it ends up getting a completed result, we exit, because that means that the reader's given up and exited out on us. And when we're outside of our own loop, because we've, we've not got any bytes back from the socket, we complete ourselves. And that says we've written everything we're going to. On the reading end, uh, we await with read async. So this is that bit where I, where I said there's going to be these multiple awaits, which are traditionally would give us multiple tasks. But in this scenario, because of that sort of I value task source thing, it's going to reuse the same kind of awaitable object. Gets us eventually a read result. So as soon as something has been flushed by the writer, we get a read result. We can access the buffer on that. But now we've got this other new type that's quite interesting called read-only sequence. 
So because the pipe doesn't know in advance how much data you're going to give it or the socket's going to provide it, it can't pre-allocate the perfectly sized buffer. So it creates a buffer uh, from the array pool um, and it keeps using that until it's filled. If it does fill it, then it will just ask for another um, array from the pool and it will start filling that one. And this just becomes a sequence then of these different arrays. And this read-only sequence is kind of like a linked list of arrays essentially, and it keeps track of the kind of the full data. So you can see this larger contiguous region over these different pieces of memory. Um, you don't have to worry too much about that. You just work with the sequence. So you can you can do a position of to see if this uh, the data that you've been given so far includes a, an end of line. If it does, we'll parse the line and we'll process it in some of the things. So we can use techniques like slicing here to slice the appropriate portion of it from the start to wherever that end of line character was. And then we can kind of keep going until we've got nothing more uh, that we can read from it uh, and no more lines in there. And then we tell it to advance. So we say how much we've read and how much we've consumed. So reading means we've inspected it, but we don't necessarily, we haven't finished with it. If we got a partial line, we might have got the start of a line and no end of line. We've read that, but we haven't consumed it yet. So we, we tell it what we've read and we tell it what we've consumed and it will release whatever buffers it can but anything we haven't yet consumed, it will make sure it gives us back on the next read. So we can kind of keep reading through the pipe until we've got everything. And again, if, if the writer completes, we can, we can stop and we, we can stop complete when we're done. Quick, you know, whistle stop tool. I do recommend you check the video for like more detail on that, but it is an interesting type and I have used it in one example so you can see where it might be applicable. The, the place where it is coming that's quite interesting, and I've done a blog post on this recently, is it's now exposed through the HTTP context in ASP.NET Core. So now the team have used pipelines in their code that flow from Kestrel all the way through the ASP.NET Core mechanism. They've actually exposed it to us on the context. This is an old screenshot. It's not called body pipe anymore. It's called body reader. Um, and on the uh, response, you can use a body writer to pipe, pipe bytes in there. So this gives you a, a very efficient way if you just want to work at the byte level of parsing the data. Um, and you can essentially use these middleware components really just to do some, some low level processing rather than going through the whole MVC chain. Um, and this is one of the things that's led to massive drops in allocations. Um, ASP.NET Core for the plain text benchmarks is now zero allocations after the overhead of setting up the connections. Um, so every request is zero allocations. And part of the reason is that they're using this, this pipe float approach to pass the data through the framework. So let's put this one into practice with a couple of, couple of the features. So we're going to look at um, span of T parsing uh, primarily. So the scenario in this case is we have Periodically, we process CloudFront logs, which are just logs of requests through AWS's CloudFront sort of service. Um, so we get these logs, they're, they're tab-separated files, they're just dumped into an S3 bucket and we get notified when we're there. So we're gonna, we're gonna stream the S3 file down, we're gonna decompress its contents because it's gzipped, and then what we want from that file is we want the values from three particular columns that we're gonna create as objects and index into um, an Elasticsearch database in this case, or a data store. Um, so it's 25 columns in total, but we're only interested in part of that data. Uh, so this is the original code, sort of. So I'm not using S3 here because I didn't want to work with the cloud on a demo because that's just dangerous. Um, so I'm reading from a file, um, and then the rest of this code is pretty much what a colleague had written, um, and you know, no shame here. Um, so they've used gzip stream here to decompress the data. The things that were a warning flag for us on this service was we, we, we run this stuff as containers, and we have like memory limits we set on those containers of so they don't sort of consume too much resource on the, on the hosts. This kept bumping against our memory limit, and we couldn't really work out why, because it's not doing a lot, it's not doing that often, and why was it hitting memory limits? So we, we just looked at the code, and a few things sort of struck out at me, because eventually we end up with a string that represents the entire contents of that file. And this file is about 10,000 rows on average, 25 columns of data. Uh, some of those are things like user agent strings, so it's not, not a small amount of data. So first there's this two array here, so there's an allocation of an array. Here we create a string from it, there's a UTF-8 allocation of a string. Um, and then it goes into this parsing code, and there's this library that they were using called Tiny CSV Parser, um, which works with tab-separated files, apparently. Um, and basically in the parser, it's quite simple code, you can kind of create this kind of link statement to iterate over the data, and a mapping class that tells it which, which sort of tabbed columns you want to get into uh, create an object. So it's, it, this is pretty readable, um, and that's the key point here. It is readable code. It's quite easy to maintain and reason about what this is doing. Um, but I was curious if I could kind of reduce some allocations or reduce where I thought there were some allocations. So again, I benchmarked it. We'll see those. Um, and this is the new code. And before I, I won't dive into everything, so I just want to kind of scroll 
a little bit. This is not as easy to read. Um, and that's kind of what I'm saying. This, this is more optimal code, but there's, there's more complexity here. And it would be a lot harder for someone to read, reason about what this is doing and change this without fear. Um, but basically, we're still having to decompress the file through gzip stream at the moment. Here's where I'm now using a pipe reader. So I can't use a pipe all the way from the start because there's no good way to sort of gzip through a pipe at the moment, but they are talking about that kind of flow. Um, but what I have done is I've got a pipe reader at the point where I'm, I'm, I've finished with the, the decompression stream. Um, now, this wasn't, at the time of this demo, built into .NET Core, so I was using this library by Mark Gravel, actually, called pipelines.sockets.unofficial, which always scares people. If you put a library in your code called unofficial, people will query that. Um, but you can now use the .NET APIs to do this. There is a, a, a nicer API for it. But we now have a pipe reader that's basically going to get that data that's being streamed through. So the rest of this code is similar to what we looked at before. We're awaiting the pipe reader. We're basically then looking to parse the lines from there, see if we've got any lines. So I see if there's a new line character, much like we did before. If I've got an entire new line, uh, eventually, we're going to then go into this parse line method. And as I say, you can explore this yourself and probably optimize it some more. But ultimately, in here, what I'm doing now is I'm starting to sort of use the slicing technique of parsing through this entire uh, piece of data um, without actually allocating. So you see, see this is not characters, this is bytes, because we haven't even converted it to um, sort of a character array at this stage. And so I'm actually looking for the index of the tab byte, um, and I'm counting my way through this, and at the, the appropriate tab positions, I'm slicing out the portion of that data. Now, in this case, I am then making a string from it and ending up with a, in this case, it's a struct, uh, that contains the string values I'm going to index to Elasticsearch. Um, I could get away from that, and I, I want to prototype this, where Elasticsearch does let you write raw bytes into it for its low-level API. So I'm looking at whether I can do that and avoid these string all allocations entirely. But for now, I have some string allocations, but I'm only allocating at the appropriate tab positions. So as I say, I won't go through everything there, but it is, it is all on GitHub. Um, and then if we compare how these, these two looked, so I ran this in benchmark.net. Um, so I did it, in this case, I wanted to get a vaguely proportional load test over our actual sort of volume. So this isn't a busy service. There's about 75 files a day that get dropped, or about 10,000 rows each. So I actually ran it with the same test file 75 times um, uh, to get this sort of representation. So on the original code, uh, about 3,500 uh, milliseconds. Optimized, it's about uh, four 500 uh, there. Seven times quicker. I'm not super fussed about performance on this one. That isn't a massive speed problem for the amount of files we're doing a day. So there's, there's, it's good, but it's not that important. The bit I was looking at reducing was allocations, but I'm higher, according to benchmark.net. Uh, and I stared at that code for quite a long while. And I, my first assumption whenever I see something I don't understand is I've, I've messed up somewhere. Uh, so I looked at it for a while. And then eventually, I contacted Adam Sitnik, who's one of the maintainers of benchmark.net. And I sent him the code. And I said, what have I broken? And he said, no, it's not you. And I said, good. Um, it's actually .NET Core. Now, this has been fixed, and it's in the latest preview. The fixed API is available, and Benchmark.net in its next version can use the new API. But the problem is, um, bench, uh, sorry, .NET Core does, did not expose an API that allowed you to find the total allocated memory across async code. It would do it for the current thread. So these are the allocations at the starting thread before it starts going into async code, which aren't very helpful. The thing that is indicative is the, the gen 0, 1, and 2 numbers. They are actually proportional for the number of allocation, uh, sorry, gen 0, 1, and 2 collections that have occurred. And it hints that it's significantly higher in the original code. So I asked what I could do about this. As I say, today, if you use the latest previews and you got the, the nightly build of benchmark.net, you'd be fine. Um, and by preview free, uh, sorry, .NET call free and release, you'll be, you'll be fine with this. But he suggested using uh, .memory. So I used .memory for the first time. Um, and so basically what you do is you kind of take snapshots before and after some activity, and then you can look at the memory traffic that gives you this, the value of the actual allocations that occurred. So in the original code, 103 million objects, at 7 gig um, for, for, those, for those files that I was processing, which does sound a lot. Um, and then I tested my new code, uh, 208. Uh, and this 208 meg, I should point out, and, and a lot less objects. So I think I validated myself when I'm saying that I was seeing allocations in that code, and I was able to reduce them. Um, as I say, this is a prototype at this stage, but we're now very much considering this in a few places, because this is quite significant. Um, 
When I then looked at the, the makeup of that memory, about 203 mega of that are the actual strings that I'm allocating as part of those objects that I'm actually using to send into Elasticsearch. So my overhead is actually only about five, five meg for doing the parsing logic. And as I say, I might be able to get rid of the string allocations by moving to using, just sending those bytes directly into Elasticsearch's low level API. Uh, need to test and validate that, but it might be possible. So quite a lot of reductions just from using you know, the span technique primarily to parse a file and pipelines to kind of give me a feed into the bytes without having to keep copying memory. So the final thing that I want to kind of look at this evening is uh, the new JSON APIs coming in .NET Core 3.0. Um, well, they're all in preview now, so they've come out in various preview releases. Um, so they're going to come in the systems.text.json namespace built into .NET Core. And how many of you in this room are now thinking, hang on, benchmark.net, what are Microsoft doing reinventing benchmark.net? No one? I, most people are angry when I talk to them and, and, and don't really understand the reasoning behind this. Um, the, the team... Jason. Jason.net, sorry, yeah, helps if you say the right thing. Does that change the answer to anyone? Yeah, a few people, good. Uh, yeah, sorry, it's late. Um, so the, the reason this isn't so much of a problem, and there's some sense behind this, is uh, Jason has become a very popular serialization technology much more so than it was when sort of .NET was first around. And it's intrinsic to how ASP.NET works. And one of the problems is ASP.NET today depends on JSON.NET uh, to do its deserialization, and it pins a particular version that it knows works for, for like, the model binding process and for serializing the output for APIs and things like that. And so that does mean if you bring in newer versions, you're sometimes going to end up with conflicts um, and you're not going to get the version that you want in your own code if you want to use different features. So that's one issue. The second, and uh, James Newton King, who wrote JSON.NET, um, who now works for Microsoft, so slightly onboarded to the uh, Dev Star, but he, he agrees that this is a good idea um, because he can't make massive performance changes to uh, JSON.NET very easily uh, today because he would end up breaking millions of consumers, and it, it starts to get quite complex. And so it kind of makes sense to have something in the box that does this stuff in a performant way and makes use of all of the new performance technologies. So there are kind of three levels to this. We can start working at the really low level, if you like, a bit of pain, uh, with the, the UTF-8 JSON reader and UTF-8 JSON writer. So it's geared around, at least for this scenario, web text coming in as JSON that you want to uh, read or write. Um, and so this low-level API lets you work at a very low level of uh, typically, you know, if you're reading, for example, you're basically going to read through and you're going to get each JSON token and you're going to decide what to do with it and you're going to have to understand the structure of the JSON you're working with to be able to do something useful with that. So typically, you'll only use that in very high performance scenarios where you, you know the structure and you want to get the best gain. And I have got a demo of that. Um, at a slightly higher level, if you don't want to do a full deserialization into an object, but you do want to kind of inspect it at a better level, JSON document lets you sort of work over the elements at a slightly higher level and you get these JSON elements back. Um, and then you can, and you can sort of read through those. So you can look for a particular property and then get its value. Um, and at the higher level, you've got the more classic sort of serializer, deserializer code. Um, so these are now all in previews um, and out. These other types have been talked about in issues. I haven't really ca caught up on whether they're actually anywhere yet. I don't think they're going to be out before 3.0. But the idea is that eventually it might be nice if you can just have this pipe reader or pipe writer that's actually writing and reading JSON directly and doing all of the I.O. Uh, directly off the bytes that you're getting from some, something like Kestrel. Um, so that's, it's easier to kind of show this to get an idea of what it can do. So the scenario I'm working with here, um, and this kind of ties into the last one where I'm looking at sort of using the lower level options for Elasticsearch, for example. So Elasticsearch is a document store. Um, one of its operations we can do is to bulk index a load of documents at it, um, which is just, in this case, just a REST call that we use. Um, so we need to, uh, once we've done that, we get the response back, and we need to deserialize that JSON response that tells us whether there were any errors in any of those indexing operations, and it also gives us, for every document we try to index, some additional metadata. So we want to work through that JSON document, and we want to basically know, if there were any errors, what, which uh, document IDs failed. And so then we can work out what we do in that scenario. So that's the unhappy path that we're looking to deal with, um, but we have to parse that file. So in the example, uh, bulk response parser, so this is the entire kind of original approach how you might do this. So you can see, even without the spaces, it's probably, what, nine lines, eight lines of code? Not very big. 
We're using JSON.NET. We're using its kind of streaming API so it can take our stream. Um, we deserialize into this bolt response type. Um, and as soon as we've got it deserialized, we can then check the errors property on that. And if there are no errors, we can, turn, we can return this tuple that says, yeah, it was successful, and we turn an empty array because there's no error IDs. If it did error, then we need to look at the ones with a status of 400 and get the, the ID. So very simple, simplified version of what we might be doing, um, but reasonably simple with classic sort of JSON APIs that we might be familiar with today. And in the improved, and I say improved because I mean optimized, but not necessarily easier to read, I'm going to scroll again just to give you a proportional view. This is how you do it with the new API. <laughs> if you use the JSON reader. And I might be able to improve this. this these APIs, by the way, warning, these have changed a bit uh, through the previews. So some of the, some of the methods and uh, properties I'm calling might not actually exist anymore. I need to update this. But the basic idea, the, the difference here, so I'm using the array pool. Uh, so I could have used the pipe reader again because I've got a stream. But in this case, I decided just to rent a buffer and then read from the stream using that buffer. Um, so I've, I've read from the stream. I've got some data. Um, and then I'm going to call this parse errors method, method here. Um, and you can see that this takes, as one of its inputs, it takes a JSON reader state and it also returns it. So the UTF JSON reader is a re-entrant type. You, it, it can work with data as you get it. Um, so you don't necessarily have to have the full uh, JSON bytes immediately available to you to start passing them in. You just pass them in. Um, you say if it's the final block of data or not. And if it's not, then it's going to return you a state object that you pass in the next time so it can kind of continue where it left off. So this allows me to kind of stream the data in as I get it off the wire. Um, and once I've got that, I create this JSON reader object passing in the state. And then I call the JSON.read method, which is the one I think they may have renamed. I'm not sure. But then basically, you can look at the to current token that it's on. And it will identify. And it could be something like a start object, code brace or something. Um, so you basically then have to do this horrific switch statement where you switch your way through the tokens. So I know the shape of the object, and I know the errors properties near the top, and it's the thing that I'm kind of most interested in, because if there are no errors, I can finish my work immediately. So basically what I'm doing is I'm parsing through until I know I've gone through this loop enough times, and it's not necessarily the best way of doing it, but until I know I've found a property with the errors name in there, and then the next loop round, I look to see if it's a true or false value, and I know that that true or false represents the error state or not. And at that point, I can exit quite early if I need to. Otherwise, I would continue processing through, looking for all of the IDs of all the, the, the messages. So back up here, this is this bit of code where I can short circuit here. In the, in the happy path, the 99% case where bulk indexing succeeds, um, if the error, found errors property has been found and it hasn't got any errors, stop. Stop parsing, forget the rest of the bytes. We don't do any more work because basically we know we've got no errors. That's all we wanted to check. If we've got errors, then yeah, we have to do the rest of the work. So with that sort of me mechanism, I have to know the shape of my JSON. I have to trust it's not going to change too often. But I can be write very specific code for a very specific scenario and make it optimal. Um, again, some benchmarks on this. Uh, so I've got benchmarks for the failure response and the success response. So unlikely case, most likely case, in at least we hope. Um, so in the unlikely case that there is actually an error, then you can see I have optimized in terms of time a fair bit. Um, so we've, we've knocked off maybe we're down to a third of what we were before. Um, and the allocations have gone down quite a lot. I'm still curious why I've got 16K of allocations, and that's an, a job for another day. But it's still significantly less than the, the previous case. The interesting bit is really on the success path. Because JSON.NET doesn't know until it's deserialized the entire object and we've been able to look at the properties on it, whether it's good or bad, it's, it's taking roughly equivalent amount of time. Um, but the optimized op option is going to short circuit out of that loop very quickly. And the main thing is that we're now only allocating 80 bytes. If we've parsed basically the first bit of that data that we got given, we established we had no errors, and we moved on with our day. Um, so this, this approach of manually parsing JSON, while complex, used in the right locations can be quite useful. So I'm nearly done. I'm going to wrap up with how you tell your bosses tomorrow that you can do some of this work. Um, so I've kind of tried to, to boil these down to actual numbers. So a lot of what I've shown you is mainly prototype code. Um, some bits of it I'm slowly moving into some production scenarios. And certainly new things that I'm building, I'm thinking about things like span from the start, where it's appropriate to do so. But for one of our services, one of our services processes all of our events coming in from our sort of data analytics collection. So that's, again, equivalent to about 18 to 20 million messages a day. 
And we have this input process that takes those, enriches them, works out some additional things about sort of routing them to the right places, and does some other work. So it's, it's quite busy and it's quite intense. Um, and rough, you know, back of a napkin figures, looking at the features that we've got and looking at the prototypes I've done, I think we can maybe knock off 50% of our allocations-ish um, and possibly double our, our throughput of number of messages we can process per second with the same instance. So what this means, if I kind of work this out on our actual numbers, is that maybe that means we save a VM under our, our container cluster a year, um, which is roughly equivalent to $1,700. So I've now got a monetary value for the numbers that I've been working with. The next thing is to establish roughly how long I think those changes are going to make, and then the business can kind of do a cost analysis there and say, how much is it going to cost us in dev time to do this, and is that worth the saving we're going to gain? But bear in mind, this is one service out of many tens or hundreds of microservices uh, that may be able to make use of the same techniques because they're doing similar kind of work, and maybe we can actually make this gain uh, a much bigger figure with, with not much more work. So really, if you're trying to get business buying on this kind of stuff, um, Try and identify some quick wins in your code. So do some profiling on your, your applications today. Identify hot paths that maybe have high numbers of allocations. Take a quick look at the code and just see if you can see any of those obvious warning signs. You know, string.split, um, maybe using traditional JSON APIs, maybe you know, using an array over and over again. Some of the things we've looked at tonight. But if you can see those opportunities, then maybe do a, a prototype. And if you can get some business time to do it, great. If you can't, I mean, I did mine in lunchtime. I don't advocate everyone using their lunch breaks for this kind of stuff. But if you're interested and you want to learn about it anyway, maybe just see what you can do in, a, in an hour or two. Um, and be scientific in that approach. Make sure you, you do benchmark before and after. Do get the numbers to prove to the business uh, what that looks like. But going to a business owner or someone sort of slightly in the sort of product side and saying, hey, I've reduced my allocations by 100 megabytes is probably not going to excite them all that much. Um, what you want to do is put this into monetary value like I did on the last slide. So try and work out roughly what that might save you if you can apply it through that code base. Try and give a sort of a, a benefit to those so that there is a proper cost to benefit uh, ratio that can be established and, and get the business on board with trying this stuff. Again, contextually where it applies. You know, if you've got lots of these services that are processing things that we have, if we can reduce the number of instances of containers we run and ultimately reduce our cluster, that's a cost benefit and it means you know we're getting better better bang for buck in what we're building so that is a lot of information for a hot evening um, let's try and summarize in a few simple things so measure don't assume um, assuming is bad particularly in performance stuff because as I've tried to kind of show some of the changes uh, are quite complex and just because they work somewhere doesn't mean they're also going to work in another place in your code base um, once you have sort of measured your code be scientific and make small changes and iterate on that approach uh, prove that those small changes make the benefit you think. Uh, do focus on your hot paths. Don't go and optimize something that's called like 1% of the time. That's a fool's errand. Um, if you can, don't copy memory. So use something like span and slice it. If you've got parsing code, if you're writing something that's working with strings often or processing files like we are, um, span and, and slicing can be really powerful there. Um, array pools are good if you find you're in a situation where you are using arrays a lot. Uh, look at considering pulling them from the pool and seeing if that gives you a gain. Pipelines for I.O., it's a little bit of a rarer case, I think, where this applies, but you know, as it's easier and easier to get stuff off of uh, ASP.NET Core uh, as pipes, you might then start to find a benefit for those. Um, and the new APIs for JSON, again, can give you some performance gains. Just switching to their deserialize and serialize higher level APIs can give you about a two times boost, roughly, in their numbers um, from traditional JSON.NET. So just switching over which isn't a huge code change. It is a limited feature set, so it doesn't do everything today, and some of the attributes you work with might not exist, so you're gonna to have to check your scenarios are gonna work, um, but it is a good place to look. Couple of resources. So this book is my Bible at the moment, uh, Pro.NET Memory Management. It's a big book. I brought it because it's just huge. Um, it's this. <laughs> So this is everything you want to know about how memory works at a hardware level in the like, first couple of chapters, um, and then more how the, the, the CLR and the runtime use memory, how the garbage collection process works. I think probably that chunk of it is like garbage collection, uh, a third of it. Uh, it's a big book. I'm going to use this tonight. If anyone comes and attacks me, I could kill a man with this. <laughs> um, I recommend you get it. It's, it's a good read, and it does talk about span and array pool and all of those other features as well towards the end. Um, so it's, it's got some practical application that you can apply and you can sort of take what I've used and see other examples of it. 
Um, the other book that I recommend without having read it yet, because I've got it on pre-order, is Pro.NET Benchmarking. So Andre is one of the other maintainers of Benchmark.NET. Um, so he's written this book about how to benchmark .NET code. Um, so I'm going to be really interested to read that and see you know, how I can make sure my benchmarks are measuring what I think they are. Um, so I recommend sort of looking at that one. Um, thank you very much for listening for an hour and a half. Again, do reach out to me. If you have any questions, I will try and answer them. Um, check out my blog, see if any of the posts are about high performance. I've kind of tagged things with high performance. Uh, so that should give you some more detail around the benchmarking. Uh, the dot memory stuff, um, and some of the other examples like string.create. Um, I can take questions if there's time. I will leave these up. Um, again, if you've got the earlier slide, you've, you've obviously got these. But if not, that's the link to the slides. The rest of them, the, the demos, some other resources that are, are kind of useful. Cool. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, <laughs> nice to see you.